Hey, good morning. <laughs> good morning. Um, so today we're carrying on with um, Evans's uh, uh, version of the causal theory of reference. Um, immediately after, we, we'll have one more session on Evans on Wednesday, and uh, then I'm going to change the schedule and. Um, bless me. <laughs> um, uh, we'll move on to Wittgenstein on following a rule, the central passages of uh, investigations right after that. Um, we'll do basically the same. Uh, I, I haven't yet made, changed the syllabus on the website, but I will do that by tonight. Uh, okay, any questions about that? So straight on to Wittgenstein after this. Um, okay, so uh, I want to begin just by going over quickly the stuff we did last time um, and making a remark about how that applies to natural kind words. Then uh, comment on what seemed to me um, the most, it's a little bit technical and a little bit hard to see what he's after in Evans's official formulation of his theory. And then um, what I hope we can spend most time on is putting some perspective on the causal theory of reference, because one thing you might have thought about causation and reference is, what do they have to do with one another? Why is this happening? I mean, maybe it's kind of plausible that um, reference requires causation, but is there a bigger picture in which you can understand why it is that causation seems to be a key notion? Okay, so last time we were talking about this example of Evans's, here we have um, uh, uh, the youth, the famous emperor, and um, uh, what is it, 1793? Um, just before Waterloo. Uh, and uh, most, of our, most of the information that we have about Napoleon comes from this mid-period, the emperor of Europe, the great military strategist, and so on. So um, if uh, we have an individual, a alpha, there, who covers this part of Napoleon's life and then is uh, replaced by an imposter um, at this late stage, if Beta comes in at this late stage, pushes Napoleon into a ditch and um, takes over the three-cornered hat right here, and we say, did Napoleon fight at the Battle of Waterloo? Then the answer is, no, Napoleon did not fight at the Battle of Waterloo, right? His place was taken by an imposter. If, on the other hand, um, the Beta had taken over much earlier and had shoved the youth into a ditch and then gone on to um, become emperor of Europe and so on, and then you say, uh, well, in that scenario, where Beta takes over at a much earlier stage, in that scenario, did Napoleon fight at the Battle of Waterloo? Then the answer is, yes. Right? No? Um, if what happened was that this youth was shoved into a ditch at the age of um, 21 or whatever, and uh, then um, the guy who shoved him into the ditch won all the famous victories, unified Europe under the French Empire, then uh, when we talk about Napoleon, who are we talking about? The youth or this guy? This guy, right? And did this guy fight at the Battle of Waterloo on this scenario? Yes. So did Napoleon fight at the Battle of Waterloo? Yes. yes. <laughs> right. Okay. So that's the idea that um, what matters for reference is who's the dominant source of the descriptions you associate with the term. Who's the dominant source? The guy in the middle is the dominant source. So whichever one he is, that's who you're talking about. Yeah. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, there are also these cases of reference shift. Um, Spot the dog was our early example. Evans also gives this case of Madagascar, a hearsay report of um, Mali or Arab sailors. Uh, and then uh, you can understand what's going on in this kind of case um, uh, by saying, 
what's going on here is that there's a shift in the dominant source of the information associated with the NEM. So that what happens is that uh, when the Malay or Arab sailors are talking, the dominant source of the information that they associate with the name Madagascar um, is a bit of the mainland. As Marco Polo takes it over and uses it as a name of the island, uh, the dominant source of the information we associate with the term comes to be the island. Was that too fast? Yeah, so you've got a shift in reference there. Yeah. So this is a kind of key example because it brings out what's wrong with um, Kripke's theory and right about Evans. is why Evans' theory beats Kripke's. Because what's going on here is that uh, you had an initial dubbing of that part of the mainland and everyone in the causal chain since then intended to refer to the same thing as the people before them. Everyone was doing their best to keep continuity of reference. Yes? This is not like the case in which I call my dog Wittgenstein, where I'm not even intending to preserve reference. These people were all intending to preserve reference, but the reference shifted nonetheless. So, references, so as against Kripke, reference is shifting despite you got, you, there being a causal chain all the way back to the mainland and an intention to preserve reference all the way through. But what's happened is there's a shift in the dominant source of the information associated with the name. If I'm explaining this correctly, that should be absolutely plain. Whether you agree or not, the, the argument should be absolutely clear. Yeah? Okay. Um, so what preserving reference demands is not that you intend to refer to the same thing as the people before you. What matters is that you keep the same dominant source for the body of information you associate with the name. Now you can apply all this stuff to um, natural kinds, words like water and gold and tiger and so on. And what happens in Twin Earth is you've got a dossier of information associated with uh, the word water, um, participates in the evaporation, um, condensation, precipitation cycle, uh, uh, clear, quenches thirst and so on. So you've got a similar dossier on Earth as you have in Twin Earth. Um, but on Earth, the dominant source for that information is H2O. On Twin Earth, the dominant source for that information is XYZ. So if you moved from one planet to the other, then at first, uh, uh, the reference would be the same because the dominant source of the information you associate with the term would be the stuff from your home planet. But um, as time went on, the dominant source of the information you associate with the term would be the stuff in your new home. Okay, so your reference would shift slowly from uh, Earth to Twin Earth. Yeah, yes? Okay, you run a marathon in Earth, yep. Yes. Yes. What I've just said implies that you would be wrong. But um, if you say, well, that's obviously not the right answer, then um, <laughs> I, can, I can fudge a little bit to try and accommodate that. Um, so the, you run the marathon, you drink the water, it's just fantastic. That memory is burned in your brain. Whenever you think of water, that comes back to you. Your lost cord. That experience of drinking water, you always wish you could quite recover. Something like that? Um, well, better. <laughs> right, yes. Right. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is, that it, uh, one of the disagreeable things about this theory is that there is room for a lot of flexibility in the notion of the dominant source. Um, and uh, uh, as Evan says, your reasons for your interest in the thing might affect what, what, which information counts, which causal source counts as dominant. 
Um, I suppose we ham up your example a little bit and suppose that what you're always trying to do is recapture the context of that perfect drink. Yeah. Then I think it would be fairly intuitive that the dominant source is that early encounter. Yeah. And it stays that way even though time changes. Yeah. Someone who just forgets drinking water over time, on the other hand, there'll be no point in saying the dominant source has to do with what was happening 20 years ago. Yeah. Your case is a little bit difficult because it falls somewhere in between. Yeah. I mean, if you say, uh, would you really want to be in a position to say, look, you're wrong, water doesn't come out of the taps here, water doesn't fall from the sky? Yeah, you're never getting what you ask for when you ask for a glass of water. It seems to me, I, I, intuitions are not clear about that, it seems to me. My intuitions are not clear. Does that make sense? Okay. I think what, I, I think what your example presses at is the... Is, the need to say more about what dominant means. The reason I give the Napoleon example is it's so clear there that one, the, you, you can see why one person rather than another is counting as a dominant source of the information. So there is, there is something very intuitive here. But making this into a, an explicit general account is not easy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Okay. So you can have just the same structure for names for substances as you have for names of people here. You could have unintended shifts of reference if your dominant source shifts without you realizing it. Yeah. So we don't need to think of natural kind terms as Kripke thinks of them as involving an initial dubbing and then a causal chain plus an intention to preserve reference. That's the Kripke theory, that two-part theory, the initial dubbing in the causal chain with the intention to preserve reference. And what these kind of examples seem to show is that that two-part structure is not right. Because you can't have the shift to reference even though you have both these conditions being met. And Evan says the point of his paper is to restore the condition connection which must exist between strict truth conditions and the beliefs and interests of the user of the sentences if the technical notion of strict truth conditions is to be of interest to us. So this is supposed to be more of a real world conception of reference. If it's the dominant source of your current body of information, then it's something that matters to you. Whereas something that's merely at the end of a causal chain going back to an initial dubbing perhaps several centuries ago, that's not really so important, what went on in that chain of that initial dubbing several centuries ago. What matters is who's the dominant source of your present collection of information. Okay? That's just to state what the theory is. Okay, very good. Um, so I, I want to work over just, the, 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 I think this is the, the most technical bit in Evans's paper, and it seems to me needlessly technical. I don't think it's actually, I don't even think it's correct, actually. So, but let me just work over this because I assume that you're still trying to do this thing of working back and forth between the readings and the section in the lecture. Yes? We are all still doing the readings. Yes? Right, right. And there's certainly, I, I mean, <laughs> just smile at me. <laughs> there's much more in Evans's article than I'm uh, covering in the lecture, as, as you, you all know, right? It's a very rich article, lots of examples. Um, what I'm going to do now is just try and talk, over, talk through what I think is the hardest to crack bit of the article, the hardest to see what he's why he puts things the way he does. So he says, a speaker intends to refer to the item that is a dominant source of his associated body of information. That's a little bit strange, that. I think he means that as a kind of definition of intending to refer. Um, uh, It's, it's a little bit intuitive. Um, the kind of way you'd use it is, if I'm telling you a great long story about Louis XIV, uh, and I'm saying to you how Louis XIV was very badly treated by the British and was eventually put in prison on Elba by them, um, but uh, obtained a glorious release and went on to fight at Waterloo. Um, after a bit, 
you might say to me, you don't mean Louis XIV. You mean Napoleon. Right? You were intending to refer to Napoleon. So that, because Napoleon is clearly the dominant source of the information that I'm using. Yeah? So that's the, 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 that's the kind of thing he means. You mean to refer to. You're trying to refer to. The, the, that's just a definition, the item that's the dominant source of your associated body of information. Then he says, well, success in reference in any particular case is relying on common knowledge between speaker and hearer that the name has been used to refer to X by um, the members of your community. And this is the kind of anti serial clause, not uncommon knowledge that the referent meets, matches, predicates in the cluster. How are we doing? I know it's early in the morning, but is it kind of plain that that's the anti serial point? Serial said the referent is whatever matches the cluster of descriptions associated with the term. This is not a match theory. It's not satisfaction of the predicates in the cluster. That's the important thing. It's not whether he actually did escape from Elba and so on. It's whether he's the source of the information about escaping from Elba. Um, so what goes on is we have this practice of using a name, um, Napoleon. Uh, we all know that we're using it to refer to this person. Everybody knows that we're all using it to refer to this person. And um, uh, when I say Napoleon, I'm relying on your knowledge that the name's been used to refer to that person before. Something like that is the theory. It's a little bit complex um, because uh, really most of us wouldn't really have thought about this stuff before starting a class on it. Yeah? Um, I mean, do you really know that people intend to refer to the dominant source of their information? before you did this class? I mean, think about these poor benighted people who've never taken a philosophy class but talk about Napoleon the whole time. Do they really know? <laughs> well, you, <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> Historians. <laughs> um, do they really know all this stuff? Does anybody who's using a name really have this reflective knowledge of what's going on? Um... um Evans sums up his theory by saying, Napoleon is a name of X if there's a community C in which it's common knowledge that members of C have in their repertoire. The procedure of using Napoleon to refer to X, that is, with the intention of referring to X, that is, with uh, having X as the dominant source of the body of information associated with the term. Now, is that common knowledge among English speakers? I do not believe it. Uh, I mean, even if Evans' theory is perfectly right, this is really a little bit fancy. Um, yeah? Uh, uh, I mean, I, <laughs> I know that we prefer our refutations of, log of philosophical theories to be, this is a contradiction, but, um, yeah, the objection to this one is just it's a bit fancy. Yeah, it, it ascribes to people knowledge that they don't really seem to have. Um, so let me try and put this in perspective. I mean, do we really have to be explicit about this? Uh, I mean, an ordinary or ordinary thinking. Suppose you think about using a term like um, this piece of paper to refer to a particular piece of paper um, or that table or that person. Um, then what's going on there is you could say, well, this isn't using a name if I just say that man over there. Uh, but uh, it's the same kind of structure because in perception I've got a whole bunch of information about a particular individual. And the person I'm referring to is the person who's the cause of me having all that perceptual information. Remember that thing with the tomatoes? I got a tomato behind a mirror. I got a tomato I can see in the mirror. And I say, that tomato. Which one am I talking about? Okay, here, here this is me. I can see, uh, this one's, I can see in the mirror. This one is hidden by the mirror. Okay, I use the term uh, that tomato. I say that tomato is red or that tomato is mine. Um, which tomato am I talking about? The one in the mirror. I mean, the, the, this one. Yes, the one reflected in the mirror. Not the one hidden by the mirror, right? Um, so I can refer to the thing uh, when there's that causal connect between me and it. Yeah. 
it's the dominant source of my perceptual information. So Evans' theory applies here too. But that doesn't require that I be thinking about uh, that being the dominant source of my perceptual information. It just is the dominant source of my perceptual information. Therefore, that's the one I'm talking about. If I just, I have here a simple piece of chalk. Yes? Now, you can think about this chalk. Yes, you can say, what is he going to do with it? Um, uh, does that require that you be thinking, this chalk is the dominant source of my body of inf current body of perceptual information? No, you didn't need to think that. But so long as the chalk actually is the dominant source of your current body of perceptual information, you can think about it. So when you perceive an object, you can think, well, I'm getting a cluster of, of information, I'm getting a dossier on that thing. And the dominant source, that just is the object you're seeing. So you've got a perceptual system here. I mean, just, as, just having vision, you've got a perceptual system that organizes itself around particular objects in your vicinity. That's what your perceptual system is good at. Any animal is going to have a similar perceptual system that, not any animal, but most animals, that organizes itself around the objects around them. A tiger seeing its prey has got a whole bunch of information about that thing. It is not reflecting on what's the dominant source of that information, but it still sees particular objects. So when you get that, the, um, that flamingo or whatever, uh, then uh, uh, you are referring to whatever is in fact the dominant source. But there's no obvious role here for explicit common knowledge or intention. Um, if you talk about photographs, uh, what a photograph is a photograph of, you could say a photograph is a photograph of whatever is the dominant source of the information in the photograph. But this stuff about common knowledge or intention doesn't really seem to the point there. Um, even if the photograph was taken by a machine, it's still a photograph of a particular person, whatever anybody intended. And it seems similar for memory. So if you just think what kind of cognitive creatures we are, we don't just use language. We have perception, we have memory. And if you ask, who is it you're remembering? If you remember a particular glass of water, then that flash bulb in your memory, which thing you're remembering is the thing that is the dominant source of your current body of information? So you could think what's going on is in perception, in perception, or if you think of this over time, in perception I get information input to me, I'm referring to whatever is the dominant source of that information. Over time, that perception, that causal chain goes on. I get wired up with other perceptual inputs I have, and so on. And you've got here a system for finding out about its environment. And when you say, well, which object is it finding about it in its environment? It's just finding out about the objects that are the dominant sources of its current information. So you could think of... Um, uh, the way we talk to each other as just being an extension of those more basic perceptual systems. That's to say they work in just the same way. If you and I are talking about someone, then we're getting information about whatever thing is the dominant source of our information. That's just the way it works. Um, and you could think, well, here's the way it goes. You get the person that we're talking about here inputting into my perceptual information then I talk about them to you, you put that together with your perceptual information. Um, the whole information gathering system that you have, whether it's perception or memory or language, is all working in just the same way. And it's not a matter of what we have common knowledge of or what we think about. That we, we don't need this kind of clause in Evans uh, where we talk about the common, common knowledge that we have in our repertoire. Um, we can just say, Language works in the same way as perception or memory. I'll try and amplify that kind of point in a moment. Is that reasonably clear? I'm really saying it's not so much that I'm trying to explain that relatively technical formulation in Evans as to say you can set it aside. I don't really think this is what's valuable about the theory. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm saying that's how it is. 
I, I actually do not think Evans would have disagreed. Um, um, I, I, I think he didn't really address the question. Uh, uh, but um, I, th I think if he had addressed it, he would very likely have agreed. Yeah, I, so I don't think this is some wildly left field idea uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm expressing here. But what I'm saying is, if you think of um, an animal that can perceive and remember, but that doesn't have language, the way you describe what it's doing is finding out about particular objects and having memories of particular objects. And that would work in that dominant source kind of way. And language is just working in the same way. Human language is just working in the same way as the cognitive system of an animal without language. Yeah. So far as reference goes. Okay. Well, on that cliffhanging point, um, let's... Um, uh, look a little bit about, I, I want to try and put this in a much broader context. So I'm actually not going away from this point. If you're puzzled by that, then you will have an opportunity to raise questions in just the next couple of minutes. Um, suppose you ask what the function of language is, and what good does it do you having a language? Um, we talked about this a bit in the very first meeting, but um, uh, I want to come back to this with one particular answer in mind. There are lots of answers you could give to the question, what is the function of language? But surely one basic thing is that it transmits knowledge from speaker to hearer. That's to say, um, if I can see around the corner and you can't, and you say to me, is he coming? Then um, uh, I can tell you, he's coming. And then it's for you, just as if you'd seen him. Do you see what I mean? Should, you, should I go over that again? I mean, one way you can find out whether he's coming is to have a look yourself. Another way is to ask me. So my uh, talk does the work that perception could have done. If someone reliable tells you something, then it is for you just as if you'd seen it yourself. I mean, that's kind of obvious with animals, that an animal call sign, there's a predator around, um, can make the whole flock react just as if any one of them would have if they'd seen the predator themselves. Yeah, that's why animals have these alarm cries. Yeah, so there's something really basic about that. So the basic picture is the speaker makes an assertion, the speaker says something, the hearer trusts and understands them, and then you get knowledge. Yes? That's a really basic thing in language. I mean, obviously, if you're very sophisticated, you're not going to believe a lot of the things that people say to you. But there's a really ground floor level at which you have to believe um, the things that people say to you. And we do treat uh, language as a way of um, getting, conveying knowledge in really basic cases. Um, you know the lottery paradox? Have you guys come across the lottery paradox? Put up your hand if you know about the lottery paradox. One. Okay. <laughs> the lottery paradox is this. Um, suppose I buy a ticket in a lottery. Then um, suppose there are another hundred, there have been a hundred tickets sold. What are the odds of my winning the lottery? One in a hundred. Right? Not a very good chance. It's 1991 that I will um, not win. Yes. Do I know that I'm not going to win? No, I don't know I'm not going to win. Suppose there are a million tickets in the lottery. Yeah. Um, so I have only a one in a million chance of winning. Do I know I'm not going to win? No. Um, so no matter how high the probability is that I'm not going to win, I still don't know that I'm not going to win. So knowledge can't be identified with um, merely very probable belief. I can make it a million million tickets. I can make it a Google of tickets, and I still don't know I'm not going to win. Yeah? Okay, so let me, put it, l l let me twist this a little bit. Suppose that you've bought a ticket in the lottery. Can I, do I, as a candid friend, have the right to say to you, you're not going to win? No. Even though it's very, very probable. Yes? 
I don't have that right. So, not, if, if I'm going to assert something, it's not just that what I say should be very probable. It's that I have to know that it's right. If I'm going to tell you, it's one thing if I tell you you're not going to win because I know the thing has been fixed and you're definitely not going to win because someone else has already won or it's all been rigged. But if I only know with a high prob- if I only have a high probability belief you're not going to win, I don't know the right to say to you you're not going to win. Okay? So when we're using language, we're using it for the purpose of transmitting knowledge in these kind of simple basic cases. And then you can think of language as a kind of long range perception. It's an extension of your perceptual system. If someone's telling you that P, it is for you as though you'd seen uh, for yourself that P. People do sometimes say, well, you have to be very suspicious of what people tell you. When I was nine years old, um, someone gave me a, um, a notebook in which they'd written, son, never believe anything you hear. Um, and this was given to me as a piece of golden information that would guide me well through life. Just don't believe anything that anyone tells you. Um, and um, <laughs> that is really not good advice. Um, <laughs> You can see what they mean, right? You should be suspicious, you should be wary. But the idea of not believing anything that anyone tells you, I mean, if you really went that far, you couldn't so much as learn the language in the first place. Suppose that you're two years old and you've got this advice, never believe anything that anyone tells you. And they're saying, and the Trump is trying to explain to you, what does red mean? And they're saying, this is red and this is red and this is red. That's not red, that's not red, that's not red. And you're saying, I don't believe any of that. Um, then you have no hope, right? You have no way of ever learning the language. Um, and as for uh, just ordinary knowledge of common affairs, I mean, um, if you take some very exotic place like um, uh, Scotland or um, Australia, and you ask, well, how do most of us know there is such a place even? You don't know it because you actually did some visual inspection yourself. Yeah, you rely on what people told you. I mean, you, you couldn't have a fraction of the knowledge you have unless you relied on what people told you. So, uh, being able to um, trust and get knowledge from other people uh, uh, seems to be fundamental to the functioning of language. We treat it that way in everyday life anyway, in these glossary paradox kind of cases. But when you think about how language learning has to work and for there to be a stable language at all, you just got to be taking it that language can give you knowledge. But then suppose you think of how you'd explain what an assertion is made using language. Well, you can think of a perception as, here I have knowledge in my head, there is the world out there. Perception is just something that gives me knowledge of the world. That's not a bad definition of perception. If you're looking at an animal, if you're looking at some, some creature that lives deep in the ocean, deep in an ocean trench, and you ask, well, can it perceive its surroundings? What you're asking there is, does it have something, some organ or something, that will be an intermediary between what's going on in its environment and it getting knowledge of its environment? Perception is just something that comes in, that if in between you and the world gives you knowledge of it. So you could think of assertion in a language as like that. You could think of assertion as being like perception. There's what's going on in the world out there. There's your knowledge and assertion is something that in language can mediate between the stuff that's going on in the world and you getting knowledge of it. So if you've, if I, if you've got not, if you know about something and you tell me uh, and then now I know about it, then your assertion is what allowed me to get the knowledge that you had. Yes? You can think of assertion, what you're doing when you make a statement in a language as really defined in terms of knowledge the possibility of it generating knowledge in the hearer. So what does cause have to do with this? If we talk about reference, then reference is really basic to language functioning the way it does. But what does cause have to do with our objectives in using a language? That's what's puzzling. I I think about the Kripke stuff, that Kripke makes it very plausible, makes it compelling, Causation has got something to do with reference. Reference is very fundamental to the functioning of language. But then you think it seems kind of arbitrary. Why is it cause that has something to do with reference? 
How, why is it they're, they're connected? But what is reference anyway? Reference has got to have something to do with the way language plays its functions. Um, if you're going to explain what reference is as X, then whatever X is, is going to have some role to play in allowing language to function. So what's the function of language, class? What's the function of language? The transmission of knowledge from speaker to hearer. Right, very good. Um, okay, for present purposes, that's the function of language, right? So if you want that to happen, if you want the, the, that to happen, then assertion, making a statement, stating a fact, um, has to play some role in the transmission of knowledge. And you can understand reference by what it's doing in those statements of facts about the world. And what's knowledge? What's knowledge, class? Okay, here's what's knowledge. Um, everybody agrees that um, in order... Well, actually, <laughs> many people agree right, that in order to know something, you have, it has to be true, right? You can't know it if it's not true. Um, you've got to believe that it's true. And um, it mustn't be an accident that you write in believing it. Yeah, so you mustn't be just lucky. Yes, that's epistemology, right? How many of you guys have done a class in epistemology? Some? Okay, well, for the rest of you, you don't need it. I mean, this is, this is, this is, this is really the main point. Um, okay, uh, so it's not an accident that you're getting it right. That's what knowledge is. Yeah, you can't be just lucky. If I just guess what your name is and I get it right, I don't know what your name is. Yeah? Just a lucky hit isn't... Uh, uh, uh. So what's that isn't an accident mean? That's, I mean, that's what epistemology is. It's a study of what it means. It's not an accident. Yes? <laughs> I'm not sure the GSIs completely agree with that remark. But anyway, um, um, okay, so I make the following claim. It's not an accident. It's a causal notion. If I just guess your name and I get it right, then that's not knowledge because the fact that that was your name wasn't what caused me to have the belief. So what it means it's not an accident is that you know that P and the fact that P is true is what's causing you to believe that P. Yeah, knowledge is a causal notion. Oops. So if you think of perception as what gives you knowledge of the world, then in order to be perceiving this tomato rather than that tomato, I have to be causally connected to the tomato. Because it's a causal connection that means I can have knowledge. That's how I can be having beliefs about the tomato which aren't accidentally right. They're caused by the way the tomato is. That's why I can have perceiving this tomato rather than that one. So perception of the object requires a causal connection to the object. Because perception is the intermediary between the way things are out there and you getting knowledge. Knowledge requires causation, so perception requires causation. So if you're going to make a statement about an object, then that's got to be something that's capable of providing you with knowledge of the object. That's what we're saying. The function of language is to generate knowledge. Um, an assertion's got to be something that can generate knowledge. Um, so an assertion about an object demands a causal connection to the object. Otherwise, it couldn't be capable of generating knowledge of the object. So to be able to refer to O, if I'm going to be able to refer to one tomato rather than the other, I've got to be in a position to make assertions about the object that transmit knowledge of it. Yes? That's where we got to. So being able to refer to an object is being, a, being in a position to transmit knowledge to it, knowledge of it. But that requires a causal connection to the object. So reference to the object requires a causal connection with it. Well, there you are. Now you know why cause is the right notion. Why it's not just arbitrary. What Kripke found that there's a connection between cause and reference. Because reference is connected to the use of language to transmit knowledge throughout the community. And, cause, and that requires causal connections. So reference to the object requires a causal connection with the object in virtue of which you're in a position to transmit knowledge of it. 
So not just any causal connection will do. And if you think of uh, language like that, you see that it really is very similar to all our other cognitive capacities. It's very similar to the way perception works or memory works. Yes? So, what if it turns out that we just genuinely don't have any real knowledge of everything? There, we don't ever actually really have any just questions. Okay, we don't ever have any uh, real knowledge. Yeah. Well, because we're brains in a vat or something like that. Yeah. Um, well, on the face of it, if we really were brains in a vat and didn't have knowledge of anything, then what would, would we be able to refer to? Okay, do we have, okay, if you say we can refer to our own sense perceptions and so on, do we have knowledge of them? See, the reason you're restricting it like that is just that you're thinking, well, I do have knowledge of that lot in here, yeah? Um, and you're just taking it for granted. You can't ha uh, refer to any of the stuff out there if you don't have knowledge of it, yeah? Um, and that's true even if, suppose that, um, suppose that in fact you are a brilliant Berkeley undergraduate sitting in a class um, just like this one, listening to a spellbinding lecture just like this one, um, but you doze off and uh, 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 you um, have a dream in which you're a brilliant Berkeley student listening to a spellbinding lecture just like this one. You see what I mean? So even although the world is just the way you're dreaming it to be, you're not actually getting knowledge of any of it because it's just an, it's just an accident that your dream matches the way things are. You could have been having a quite different dream. That makes sense? So um, in that case, suppose someone comes in the door and in your dream, someone comes in the door. But it's only an accident. Are you, in your dream, able to refer to the person who really came in the door? No, of course not. It's like the tomato case. There's something, you, 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 it seems to you that there's a tomato right here. But you're not able to refer to it because it's not causally connected to you. Your dream matches what's on going on out there, but that doesn't allow you to refer to any of the stuff that's going on out there. Yeah? So just having the right kind of background of um, sensory impressions wouldn't be enough to let you refer to that stuff out there. Yeah? So if you don't have the knowledge, you don't have the ability to refer. Yes, language would just stop working completely. The only possible exception, that's, that's the claim, yeah. The only possible exception to that is um, your knowledge of your own mind. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, just, uh, 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 that's a really interesting question. And actually, um, Putnam's, the next Putnam article we'll look at um, is called Brains in a Vat. And it's actually addressing the question what a causal theorist should say about um, uh, these possibilities of being uh, wh 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 where it seems like you don't know anything about the world. Yeah. Uh, Putnam's answer is quite radical and um, surprising, uh, as so often with Putnam. So um, you might want to take a look at that if you're in, if you're in, uh, already if you're interested in the question. Plain as day. Okay, so now we know what the function of language is and why reference is a causal notion. Okay, more than evidence next time. Thanks. <laughs>